today's International Literacy Day. This is a commemoration first declared by UNESCO in 1966. Today on Good Morning SKN, we mark the occasion by speaking to two individuals whose work here in the Federation involves providing the tools to help residents achieve literacy. They are Jacqueline Basu, Reading Coordinator at the Curriculum Development Unit, and Ruth Duport, Literacy Specialist. Ladies, welcome to Good Morning SKN. Good, Good morning, morning, and thank you. You're welcome. The definition of literacy, I think, is something that a lot of people think that they understand, but since you're a literacy specialist, uh, Mrs. Duport, your understanding of literacy, what can you tell us? Yes, so according to the National Assembly of Adult Literacy, literacy can be defined as being able to use print and written information to function in society to help one achieve their goals, advance themselves, and um, aspire to their full potential. Is it the same as being able to learn? I suppose it consists of a whole lot more you, than that. Definitely. It has evolved. Once it was uh, described as being able to read and write, but now we are saying you should be able to function in society, functional literacy. Because there are some persons who are able to read and write, but they cannot navigate their surroundings, their community. You know, they are in like that. And so we are saying in order to be fully literate, you must be able to apply the knowledge that you have to help you to sustain your life. So what is the percentage of literacy here in St. Kitts? According to recent research, literacy in St. Kitts is 97.8%, when that is compared to the region, St. Kitts is around fourth. On the world market, um, the world literacy is 86.3% uh, or 4%, something to that aspect, but compared to countries like Finland and China, they have literacy rate of 100%, and you know it's based on their education system. And so, um, according to the UNESCO um, document from the 2017 Sustainable Goals, we are looking at our curriculum and trying to copy best practices and moving towards filling those gaps. So, we looked at the education structure in China, education structure in Finland, and how can we use some of those positive things and adapt them to our curriculum. And we have started. Um, it's good. We have now the, um, enhanced, the curriculum. enhanced curriculum. We are looking at the blended approach to fill those literacy gaps. And we are hoping that we have more students leaving secondary certified some children are able to read, we have children that are able to read and write, but no certification, and so we want to ensure that all school leavers are certified. Understood. So, uh, Mrs. Basu, I'll pivot to you, because we talk about curriculum, I heard it come up, we talk about the importance of reading, and I know that your work as reading coordinator is very involved. So, can you give our viewers a sense of what it is that you do? Because I know it's important. Okay, I'm stationed at the Curriculum Development Unit as the reading coordinator. Uh, my role is to coordinate reading within the primary schools. I've worked with the teachers, and of late, we have um, implemented a reading intervention program, which um, works with those lo the lowest achieving students within the primary school, helping them to fill those gaps that they would have had based on whatever would have caused them to fall behind. All right, can I ask point. you a little bit more about that? Because obviously that's important. <laughs> it so is. How, how do you exactly work? I know Ms. Dupert is uh, one of your important allies in the school as well. <laughs> yes, she <laughs> is. Yes, she is. So um, within the, the primary schools, um, the Ministry of Education have established um, reading centers. And there are teachers stationed in these reading centers specifically to work with the students who are l the lowest achievers within the classroom. And so in the larger schools, we have two teachers that work um, hand in hand, one with the early grade learners and one with the, the middle, pri the upper primary. <clears throat> and so um, they would pull students out during the course of the day and uh, give extra reading lessons and teach strategies that would help them with um, reading and, and filling those gaps that they would have missed um, in their early years. 
Mr. Ford, may I? Have second. Have you got sheets on the ground? I am on the ground. Right. So currently, I am based at the Dr. William Connor Primary School, and I am a reading <clears throat> intervention teacher. Right. And so what we do, um, we look at our students from kindergarten moving upwards. We don't do any reading intervention at kindergarten because we give the children right. an entire year to master the program. Okay. And so at the end of that year, we have discussions with the classroom teachers exactly. to find out which children, you know, those children that are not meeting, meeting the expected goals. And right. so they would identify those students and we have an assessment tool mm -hmm. called the CAB R. It's a diagnostic assessment tool that just came out of the University of the West Indies. Mm -hmm. And so I'll tell you some more about well, it. And so <laughs> we administer that assessment test. It's a literacy mm -hmm. assessment right. test. And so we administer that, that assessment test and we look at the results. And based on the results of the students, we, um, it tells us which children are not performing so, at, the um, at the expected levels. And so... Those children are um, identified for reading, reading intervention. intervention. And yes. so we, we group the students. They are Ms. Real. She works with the children from infant, and I work with the children from lower and upper primary. And so we tailor instructions that so meets the students' interests, interest. their learning mm -hmm. abilities, and it help to motivate them so that we could um, fill those weaknesses and move them to strengths. And so I work with children from grade three to six, and Miss Reed work with children from grade one to two every day. Okay. We it um, yes. we can only work with a very small a number numbers. of yes. children because um, experts indicate that we cannot have too many children in the program. Otherwise, no we're going to retard the process. All right. So how many children are in the program um, on average? On average, Dr. William Connor has a world of 300 plus, so we have like <laughs> three of almost each That's grade. Mm -hmm. I work with 21 children at the end of the day, and Ms. Reed works with about the same 20, 21 okay. children at the end of the day. And so there are some cases where we do small group because after testing, we recognize that these children are at the same level. And so instruction could be applied in small group. And then there are some children that would be below that group that needs individual attention. And so we give those children individual attention also. We have discussions with the classroom teacher to check to make sure that, you know, these children are being raised above or close to no, the class really level that they are expected to function at. At the end of every semester, we test the children again. We test them as they're coming in. So this week and next week, we are going to be um, testing the children to see um, who needs reading intervention and to see those children who have any increase mm -hmm. in literacy development. And uh, after that, we we'll go back again, we discuss and decide, okay, well, let us try these strategies to see if these children will improve. Now, again, at the end of the school term, after applying tailored instruction and children are not meeting, then this program is not doing what it should do. And so we have to look for other assessment. Mm -hmm. And so that is where Michelle Jacobs comes in. She deals with dyslexia because some children peak and... Um, Classroom instructions, or let me not say classroom instruction, but uh, um, what's that word that we're looking for? <laughs> um, the formal instruction, instruction, formal, formal instruction, instruction. Yeah. they yeah. cannot function at that level. They need something, something else. Yeah. How early should a child learn how to read? Um, students, the children come into school at five, and so it is... It is practice to have them experience a year of formal um, teaching before you can assess and, and say, well, you're having learning difficulties or anything. So we usually um, encourage teachers to allow the students to have at least one year of formal instruction before um, any diagnosis takes place. Yes. So... What I like built into what we've been discussing so far, which is the work that you do, is that you are able to identify students early, and then you keep monitoring them systematically to see yes. if they're progressing or they're not. And 
You were talking during the break, Mr. Jufford, about your experience with one particular student who seemingly wasn't progressing as he should, regardless of the interventions. Uh, what can you tell us about that? Well, um, after being exposed to two intervention programs at the Dr. William Connor Primary School, we had to seek outside assistance to see if this is more than um, what is expected. And so we had to bring in another specialist, and that was Ms. Michelle Jacobs, who worked at the Special Education Unit. And so she decided that she would do uh, dyslexia test to diagnose to see what exactly um, is happening because we had already diagnosed him with a cab R assessment and those findings showed that the child had plateaued and would not be able to go any further with formal learning, learning. Mm -hmm. and that happens, it takes place. Now that was, his problem was a brain disorder because dyslexia is a brain disorder. You can be taught how to read and write even though you have dyslexia but it's a specialized set of skills, skills and persons yes. have to be trained in order to address those needs and so in um, after the test he was identified that needing special education and that is another type of intervention so the cotton thomas comprehensive unit would be the next stage that he would be moving to in order to get tailored specialized instruction that fits his needs mm. and to move him along. What we need to realize is that children learn differently. They learn at different pace. Some of them are early bloomers, some are late bloomers. All would not walk the same path. We do can't have the same expectations of all children. But what we should do, that upon leaving school, whether secondary or it be it at the Cotton Thomas Comprehensive, they must be able to function in society. And that's our objective. No matter where they are, no matter what career path they're going to take, they must be able to function in society. Long ago, we had children that weren't performing at the formal level, and so they were kept at home. And, you know, parents age and they die, and there's nobody there to look after these persons. And so we have to... <laughs> I, I realize, and I, hate to, but I realize that you had a reaction to that. So part of the work that you do, you experience that, I imagine. Yes, you, you yes, we have that. Um, had students who um, were left at home because Ow. they weren't learning at a rate that is expected of them. And so, as she mentioned, the parents die, and what happens to those students where they are without um, anyone to take care of them and a functioning society? Mm -hmm. This is, this is alarming to me because I'm seeing a lot of connections, believe it or not, between um, students' understanding, uh, literacy, their functioning, and truancy even, if they're not yes. going to be engaged school, in schools. Yeah. There were a lot of linkages. Yes. Truancy is normally uh, uh, one of the hindrances that, that prevents um, literacy, uh, literacy students from literacy. Mm. And so we have truancy officers in the Ministry of Education go and find students that are delinquent and get them tested and get them, you know, into the programs that we have in our school that everyone can have an opportunity for an education. education. Wow. And, you know, one of the reasons for truancy is your socioeconomic background. If your psychosocial needs are not being met, education is the least of your problem. If I can't eat, I don't have shelter, I can't be closed. No one is there to love and take care of me. Of course, I'm not thinking about education. And so if we get our um, society literate, because if you have a literate society, you have a society that is moving yes. forward. So if we have a society that is literate, of course, we're going to stamp out areas of socioeconomic background persons would be able to work earn and look after mm -hmm. their family so literacy is when people talk about literacy being key and they, i don't think they really understand the true meaning of literacy mm -hmm. because literacy expands to the quality of life that a person can have as opposed to someone who is illiterate i'm not saying persons who are illiterate would not be able to work but it's better to have 
a nation that is literate mm -hmm. because we are going You're to correct. have a productive nation. Very well. So what is being done to commemorate International Literacy Day today? Well, I got the information late because okay. last week we were involved in workshops. Okay. So what I did, um, I spoke to, so it happened that my EO came and I said, you know, tomorrow is World Literacy Day. I have already plastered all kinds of things over my WhatsApp page. Mm -hmm. You know, all of persons keep calling me, send me that, send me that. And so I said to him, I'm, I'm going to need you to put this information in the principal's chat so the principals can disseminate the information to their teachers and so that they can inform and make the children aware that mm -hmm. we are celebrating World Literacy today. I gave him the theme and I went on to explain a little of UNESCO's view towards mm -hmm. um, the learning space. And uh, I just happened to, I was sitting idly and I happened to hear a podcast um, about UNESCO um, transforming the learning space and that was talking about asynchronous learning, learning online. And you okay. hear persons out of India and Africa and across the world mm -hmm. saying that, you know, online learning, because they weren't probably able to step inside a brick and mortar building to access education, online learning was able to do that for them. Well, that's yeah. very important indeed. Um, you know, I wish we had more time. Mm -hmm. uh, I really think that this is a conversation we need to continue. Yes. Uh, but Ms. Basu, I'm going to give you the final word. Uh, as reading coordinator, what is something that you want parents to know as they continue uh, to send their children to schools and what can they expect from that sort of thing? What I want to make um, parents to realize is that uh, it is not up to the school alone to um, help these students who have learning gaps and that we are trying to get up to standard. Um, parents have a very important role to play. Um, they should be involved in their children's education. They should be involved in their students' learning. Learning can take place anywhere, even while you're driving them to school. Help them to read the signs, help them to read the, you know, the different signs that they will see on the way, help them to read the things that are on the house, whatever little opportunity they get to participate in this community works and helps.